On November 20th, 1968, a coal mine explosion occurred near Farmington, West Virginia. This event would forever change the rules by which we mine coal. What did not change are the basic elements of mining that make attention to safety still necessary. This fact is clear to Danny Kuhn, a rescue team member from that mine. In an interview given 30 years after the disaster, he talks about his participation in the recovery efforts. Danny, what were some of the precursors that, in your opinion, were leading up to the explosion at Farmington in 1968? Well, there was nothing that spelled out disaster, imminent danger or disaster, but there was a lot of accidents, uh, injuries, you know, and it just, um, as these progressed, it seemed like they uh, got a little worse in severity, and uh, I don't know, it just uh, gave you an eerie feeling, or I had this eerie feeling. Of course, I had that, not that much time in the mines at that time, but just uh, little things, uh, far on a belt drive, which was extinguished really in a, in a very short time, but just uh, the accidents and uh, I don't know, it just, everybody just didn't seem at the time or on their toes. Mm -hmm. And uh, I won't say everybody, but you know, just, uh, and everybody had a feeling at that time it always happened to the mine over the hill. If anything happened, it happened to someplace else, it didn't happen here. And that particular time it happened here, it, uh, it happened at uh, number nine. Where were you on November 20th? when the explosion occurred? I was off. I had been hurt on the 11th of November in a fire with the fire department. And uh, I had uh, stitches in my leg and in my hip. And uh, calcium had blown, been concussion, blew the calcium off the bones into the muscle. My leg was stiff and I wasn't working. And uh, my uh, uncle, who was the engineer there, was going through the parking lot at uh, 527 in the morning of the 20th when the mine exploded and it exploded r r right in front of him. And um, there was no phones or no power or anything at the portal end for him to do any calling. And so he went down the road to the boy that worked actually worked at the mine there and he went to his house and used his phone and he called his wife after he called the superintendent and everything. And his wife uh, in turn was from my aunt call my mother and find out if I was working because they knew I worked the midnight shift and uh, my mother told her no then my mother had woke me and uh, told me if they'd had trouble to mine that they'd had an explosion so being on a rescue team at the time I uh, even though with a handicap by the leg I could still fill air bottles or whatever needed to be done on the surface so I proceeded to the mine and of course I met a deputy sheriff at the entrance and wouldn't allow me to go up the road and of course then I showed him my mine rescue pass that I had a you know business up there and of course he allowed me to go through then and I got there at probably approximately 10 minutes after six when the second explosion came out and uh, I, I just couldn't believe it. Uh, I had thought all the time up there it might have been a, a pop on the section or something I hadn't anticipated and never even dreamed of, of the entire mine affecting it, you know, the mine the way it did and the way the at the Lou Ellen portal there was this no elevator there now the elevator was gone and the smoke was bellowing out of the shaft after the second explosion and just unbelievable. And uh, knowing nobody on the Lou Ellen portal bottom at that time could have survived that. I mean you could tell that from outside. They was shuttle carts, tires and wheels that had been blown clear up the shaft which were stored there on the bottom relatively close to the shaft and it was like say the elevator head frame and all the structure around the elevator shaft and everything like that was gone. The fan at uh, Lou Ellen was also gone. Um, just unbelievable. Did you report to anybody uh, at Lou Ellen when you came on site? Yeah, there was company officials there and uh, I uh, Ask him if you know if they well the rescue team's equipment was right at Lou Allen Portal, and at that time they would not allow anybody to go up near the portal because of the debris that was falling down after the explosion, and uh, 
the rescue teams from the other neighboring mines had been called, and of course they were en route, and there was nothing we could do because really the, the members of the rescue team were all in a midnight shift, myself included, and they were all killed ex with the exception of myself. What uh, what was going on at at A face at that particular time? A face was on the eastern side of the mine. Even the eastern side of the mine was not affected by the explosion. In fact, they continued to load coal until approximately ten after six, and their power went off. Their power was fed from the eastern end of the mine and the slope area of the mine, and there was no they were the power sources were not connected. So when the power was pulled from the mine on the eastern end. They lost their power, and uh, their AC power. The DC power was still on the trolley, and they were told on the phone that to come outside. They weren't told what. They just told to come outside. So they proceeded to get on their man trip, and started outside. And the DC power went off. Then they had to walk to the slope, which was probably at the most two miles. Once they arrived at the slope, the slope car was there on the bottom, and they just got on the slope car and rode outside. And still, to the, at that time, had not been told of the, the magnitude of the explosion on the other end of the mine. And they were brought outside, and of course, they were told. Also, up at the, the old re, old portal we had at Aether's Run, there was a motor barn repair shop and shop on, on, at the bottom of the Aether's Run shaft. We had two mechanics in there. In there, and they were called also, and they answered the phone, everything being normal, and they were told to um, come outside, go over to the elevator and come outside. And they went over and uh, got in the elevator and come outside, and of course, immediately when they got outside, they were told by one of the preparation plant employees that went after them that uh, there'd been an explosion at Llewellyn. <clears throat> and of course, they weren't aware of it either. And that was part of the group that got out. The remaining seven got out up at um, Mothins Run Shaft were brought out in a bucket. And there was 21 at total that came out of the mine. Did you go to Mothins Run? Yes, I went to Mothins Run. We were, I was at Lou Allen and we were told that <clears throat> there were some, uh, some people at the bottom of Mothins Run Shaft. And uh, some of the inspectors there were there from Bureau Mines and from the state weren't acquainted with the area at that time to know exactly where Martha's Run is. So I told him, you know, you, I'll, I'll take you over. You follow me and we'll, I'll take you over. And that's what I done. We got over there, then there was some uh, truck there and the bucket had not arrived yet. They had to go to, to Leverage Mine to get this uh, bucket to bring these men out on. And at that time there were no capsules and no escape hoist, emergency escape hoist or anything at that shaft. So we had uh, got the bucket there, they got the bucket and they dropped it down. They did not have enough rope on the cable to reach the bottom. It was, probably, it was over 500 foot deep. At that point they brought it back up, put additional rope on it, then lowered it back down. And they started to bring the men out. They brought a, a seven out at the Martha's Run shaft. Had they communicated with those men before? <clears throat> now what had happened, uh, the neighboring mine up, our neighboring company, a uh, safety director there heard about the explosion and he knew about that particular shaft being up there. He went to that shaft, more or less took it on his own to go up there and uh, he heard them beating on the water line. He knew they were men down there. So he proceeded to uh, lower gas mask by rope, blankets, bradish cloth, so, uh, self rescuers. He lowered that down to him, and probably with the carbon monoxide contents that they were getting down there, and you got to picture this as a blowing out, and the next thing in the, the shaft is intaking. And you know it's cold weather at the bottom of a shaft. <clears throat> it wasn't the fact the fans were running, but the far was sucking the oxygen back in, so they were just sort of air in the bottom of that shaft was sort of going back and forth from smoke to clear air. But and then probably the gas, in fact, to give, drop the gas mask down to them, give them protection from the carbon monoxide. And when they brought uh, three at a time out in the bucket, and all of them, those seven were rescued. There was one member that you know, that particular crew that was up in that area that they never found. He was down at the loading point, and he was uh, 
all roughly 2,800 feet from the shaft. And it made it uh, kind of rough because he didn't come out because he was a personal friend of mine. But he, uh, he did not make it. We ne he was not one of the bodies we got to recover in the preceding nine years on the recovery. We never made it up there to him. Was there an attempt to, <coughs> to explore af after the explosion before the mine was sealed? <coughs> Yes, yeah, so in about mine was sealed on the 29th and 30th of November, and probably the last effort. And they they, they done the best they could as far as rescue. It was impossible to go down to Lou Allen or Maudron Shaz because of the explosion. There were 17 major explosions. These are the ones that came outside. So the rescue team entered the eighth's run portal on the Sunday before the 29th, and the rescue teams went to the west and it was a rescue team went to the east which they traveled to haulage back to the slope bottom to make sure that no one had got up that far and you know were down and the rescue teams went to the west they went down to what we refer to as a plum run borehole or plum run overcast there and that's where your air spits changed it went from the mods run intake shaft to the aethers run intake shaft and they sort of met there at that plum run overcast and they got down to that point and they started encountering signs of CO and they actually just signs of destruction as far as plastic pipe hanging on the trolley wire and some rock dust sacks, piece of wood here, catboard or wedge that had been blown out in the track. And the oxygen level started to drop and the carbon monoxide level was going up and they were getting methane in the area also. They exported cross cuts right and left uh, and make sure and they looked for tracks and this type thing and looked all over the aces run portal bottom in the shop or where somebody possibly could have made it out, maybe only, you know, made it so far, they just couldn't find anyone. And the team that went to the east done the same thing around the slope bottom. They looked the entire slope bottom over and emptying loaded track and the dumping point, supply tracks, everything to uh, make sure there was no one in there. <clears throat> then they come out to slope. Rescue team that went to the west that came out to portal at their eighth's run. And it was determined then that there was nobody came out of the explosion area of the mine. So that being on Sunday and next day led to an agreement by the four agencies that the only way we were going to extinguish this fire, the only way we ever get back in this mine is to seal it. And that had been a talk for a few days prior to that, that that was the only way that was going to get to control it would be to seal it. And we, uh, <clears throat> when I say we, the public did not want to see this, but being even with my limited experience and talking to the other people at that time and people that were knowledgeable in mine rescue, there was no other way to do it but seal it to control that fire. We did, the mine, the fire was so massive in, underground, the explosions have been so of such magnitude that no one could have survived it, and <clears throat> the series of explosions. So a real heated, when I say heated. Uh, they were not heated to the point they were problems, but they went over thoroughly, and that was the last last resort was to seal the mine. Then on uh, the night of the 28th, I think it was 28th of November, the 17th explosion came out. I was approximately five miles on the surface away from that shaft, and this was late in the evening, and we're taking carbon monoxide samples, methane samples everything at the eighth is run shaft and uh, at the fan and of course the intake the fan was still running it on the eastern end and we were taking samples there which samples were all negative we weren't, we weren't pulling anything out of it but when that major explosion went off the 17th when it came out Martha's run shaft we were five like I say I was five miles away from it and it lit the valley up there where I was at it was just bright as day you could feel the ground shaking five miles away and uh, the federal inspector over there by the name of Carl Schaefer at the time, and another foreman was there, and we just kind of looked at each other and said they're going to they're going to seal it. And of course, it was kind of a hard pill to swallow, but that was the best thing to do. Now you had a, a <clears throat> personal friend, you had buddies who were on the mine rescue team with yes. you. Uh, what were your feelings and what preparations did you make for the recovery? It 
hit me rather hard because I worked with those guys and a lot of them I grew up with and went to school with and like I say played ball with and on the rescue team and worked there at the mines with and just uh, not having a brother a lot of these fellows that I worked with actually were just like a brother and uh, I knew that I'd gotten hurt in that fire previously a week and a week and a half prior to the explosion uh, I just kind of felt that it was, I was spared, and uh, I owed these guys something. So I made a vow to myself that I would go back. If they ever let anybody go back in there, I would go. And I went, and I talked to the general superintendent, and I talked extensively on several occasions. And that was one of the things that I told him. And of course, he said he didn't know whether he'd be there when the recovery started or not. But I said, I want to go back. I said, I'll do anything to uh, go back in. I said, if they, you know, and I talked to the director of safety at that time for the Northern West Virginia region, and I also told him that I didn't have a rescue team to belong to, but if one of the other teams was short a man or something, I'd gladly go on it. And of course, uh, we talked about it, and we decided that we could reorganize the team there at number nine with number nine people. So we started in the spring of 69 training some new people, some new members, and they moved me up to captain, and then I got a, we got a team started and got it up, and we uh, trained extensively through the spring and summer of 69, and on the 12th of September 1969, they opened the mine back up, and I was the first one that went in. Tell me about that. Tell me about the unsealing, the whole process, and then what happened when, when you went inside. Well, the plan was to ventilate the eastern end of the mine, which at, we had pretty much known that we didn't have any problems because we wasn't picking any CO up and on the readings they were taking at the sample tubes. And uh, probably the biggest thing we had to worry about on the open the eastern end up was water. And uh, we opened the seals on the slope, number one fan, and number two intake, and number two fan. And both fans were started, number one and number two. And uh, we went down on the slope bottom and opened the air airlock doors, which were down there, and brought, blocked those open to allow the air to flow. And took a lot of readings on the bottom, methane, carbon monoxide, oxygen readings. and after the fans had run, um, everything, you know, we opened them up on Friday, uh, back up a little bit, we opened them up on Friday, and they ran over the weekend. We went back in there on Monday morning and proceeded to start actually recovery. Now that was where? That was on the eastern end of the slope end, on the 8th is run portal and on number 9 slope bottom, okay. which was all on the eastern end of the mine, which showed no signs of explosion ever, ever went that far. It more or less went to where the Plum run overcast, which was where the intake of both mods run came to that point, plum run came to that, or aethers run came to that point, and it was just a, more or less a dead air space or space where the two intakes uh, got together. <clears throat> so what did you do then when you found yourself at the bottom of the slope? What was We what encountered was some water. We encountered water, which we anticipated would be there, and once we got those doors open and then got the air, uh, Flowing through the mine, we came back out and then uh, got to ready and got pumps to go back in and that type of thing and uh, get the get the water off the haulage, get the water off the track, and then uh, proceed to bring supplies in, which was going to be brought in primarily from the anything large had to be brought in from the slope end. Of course, we had to get the water off and anything, and then of course small stuff could be brought in on the elevator at Aethers Run. And then we proceeded to start westward. At about how much progress per day? How long? How long progress how long? initially the first day. We had built, or they had 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 built carts, wooden carts, with steel wheels, and they were designed to be pulled by horses. And this is a little story, but. They brought two horses in that worked in, that worked in mine and been in the mining, several mines, I guess, Barney and Fred. And I guess when the Humane Society or something decided that uh, 
it was too risky for the horses. So we had to bring the horses back outside, and the men had to pull these carts. They weren't too bad going to the, toward the west because you're going downhill. It's when you had to pull them back the other way because we had no, no electrical power in the mine at that time. So we went down to where we encountered some signs of explosion, and we set up a base, fresh air base. Of course, we were, un, we were not under apparatus as yet. Air there was good, and we proceeded to start taking air with us. and make sure We had to check stoppings on the right and left. We were trying to take air down, and we encountered water roof. I mean, the water was clear to the roof, and we couldn't get, proceed any further. At that time, we uh, started to lay an airline down there. We laid a four-inch airline, and uh, a two-inch airline, a four-inch discharge. We laid an airline down there and started air pumps, and we started pumping that water down. <clears throat> and this is, we're talking a lot of water. We're talking 90, 900 feet wide on the entries and probably went for, 15 blocks, 1,500 feet. That's a lot of water when it's all the way to the roof. So we proceeded to pump this water down, and this is uh, 24 hours a day, seven days a week on the water. And as the water went down, we had to continue to take our ventilation with us to make sure that you know everything was right, continue to make your checks. This all went, <clears throat> went well, very slow, very, very slow, pump that water down. So at the end of October, we went into mine. Actual recovery started on about the 15th of September. And the last of October, we had pumped the water down to where we seen a 50-ton haulage motor. And 28th, 29th of October, we found our first victim. He was out of the motor, laying alongside of the motor. And having known him all my life, uh, and he had an artificial leg, and of course there was no doubt to who it was when you know when I was there with him and I seen the leg and helped put him in a body bag. In fact, and uh, he he was our first victim. There was no doubt to who he was, but of course there was had to be proper procedures done, uh, proper investigation made on the, the individual to make sure and confirm that it was the right individual. But I had no doubt. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was the first motor. That motor was derailed. <clears throat> it was off the track. The air on that particular motor and the air cylinder for the air brakes was still up. It still had air on it. The air brakes were still set on that motor. That motor had been parked there, and the air brakes were set. Now, the empties that he was coupled to or had possibly had ran into, because the procedure was he wouldn't be coupled to those empties coming toward the western end of the mine. He'd ta be a tail motor. But he was up against those empties. Now, whether the he motor ran into him or what, but the having the air brake set, to me, kind of, and a lot of other people kind of felt that that air brake was set because he was parked there. Mm -hmm. and normally, you would check yourself or slow your speed down with your electric brake. Empties from that motor, the front motor, back to the rear motor were off the track, uh, derailed, uh, trucks tore out from under them, crossways the entry. Just a uh, domino effect all the way down through there. The tail motorman, we found him the next day, on the next shift, not the next day, the next shift, and he was setting in the motor. And uh, his motor also was coupled to, you know, the front car had a fall on it, half of his motor had a fall on it, but he was there just setting in the motor like he was operating it when something happened. Of course, the magnitude of this, to the novice that's not seen it, all these cars have to be moved in some way to get them out of the road, to clear the haulage, to get your supplies through, get you a, a good, safe travel way. It takes a lot of time, and uh, a lot of people felt possibly you wasn't working as quickly as you could have. But you can just get so many people in one entry, and you start moving the mine cars and everything else, you can't have a bunch of people there. It took a good while, and we had to do some roof support through there, and, and roof bolting, and cribbing, and plus you got to maintain your ventilation, your stopping lines on the outside of you, each side of you. So we were able to uh, get through there. And in 1970, we got down to well, December of '69. We got to the Mods Run shafts, both of which had been filled with gravel. We made some examinations around the bottom of them. It was decided then that they would be 
cleaned from the surface. A shaft company came in and they bucketed or mucked the, the gravel out of the bottom of the shafts. They gave us two shafts and they were intake and return. That was in December of 69 and a lot of work had to go on around it. There was a lot of uh, fires that went on around the bottom of that shaft, between the shafts, a lot of bad, bad roof conditions. There were some falls at 25, 30 feet high. Now, by that time, about how much distance had you gone and you'd recovered two bodies? At we recovered two bodies in a period of four months, and we probably went uh, all 3,000 feet. Okay. And we got down to where the shafts were, and they, they, like I say, there was an extensive amount of fire around the shaft, bo shaft bottoms, uh, roof, rib, all this had to be supported. We roofed or bolted the top, and as we would load it out, we had to bolt the ribs as the fall went down toward the bottom. Uh, then we proceeded to build arches and cover those with uh, five or seven ties to prevent any rock or anything else from falling between the bolts that were in there. Very, very extensive uh, work, uh, very slow, tedious work actually. And we were able to get down and get the two shafts cleaned out in December of 69. We proceeded to try to go westward toward the 6th north section, which would be the first working section. And we were unable to get in through the back way, through the bleeder system. We were unable to get in. Further exploration down toward the mouth of the section revealed it. Same problem. We had problems with getting into it. We were sort of at a standstill <clears throat> as to what to do. When I say we, everyone there to mind was kind of at a standstill, so we decided to bring some mining equipment in the continuous miner, and mine through the barrier, mine through the solid block of coal into the working section. So that's what we proceeded to do, and that went to about March of 1970. Did you have a belt? No, we, we loaded directly into the mine cars with shuttle cars, and coal, we had to mine the coal to get through, and we got through into the barrier, and of course in March of 70 into the 6th North area, a lot of falls in that area, particular area also. And we were able finally to get to the section, the f face area. The first three victims we encountered there were up at the miner. Were you on, on that shift where the, the exploration was done? Yes, yes. <clears throat> and there was uh, the foreman and the boatman and the mechanic were up at the miner. The rest of the crew, we weren't able to find them at that time. A lot of roof falls had occurred in that area, and we had to start again with bolting the roof, supporting the roof, and building cribs, this type thing. And as we loaded this rock and everything out, as we came, the rock level came down, we bolted the sides of the ribs until we got down to the bottom. And then we started encountering, finding some bodies and we were able to recover that entire crew on that section. Now at this time, uh, you'd been working five, six months? We'd been working at this time approximately three, or March, April, roughly six, seven months, yes. And now you've, un you've gotten more bodies. What did, what did that do uh, as far as uh, how the mine rescue team was functioning, or every, everyone for that matter? And, <coughs> The actual exploration and some of the areas that we went into, the rescue team uh, would find the bodies and recover them. And what we try to do, we'd mark them on a map and leave them there. And to the point we'd go back to a fresh air base, then we would start ventilating that area. And majority of the bodies uh, were in, recovered in fresh air. We'd take the air in and uh, sometimes the mine rescue team were generally always involved with recovering them. But many times that fresh air men also would come up and help you and, you know, help load, load the body up. We were very careful as to load all the parts and there was no, no body that I saw that was dismembered. There was, you know, there was, the bodies were intact. We loaded these bodies up and then we would uh, bring them back to a fresh air base or not fresh air base, back to an area where they could be taken outside. And fresh air men that were working there to mine normally took care of that, took them on out to the outside. 
Then they were taken to the local funeral director and the state police were involved with the actual identification and uh, coroner and I think, I don't know who all the medical examiner looked at them, mm -hmm. whatever, for proper identification. There was no problem as far as identification went on any of them. Um, and most of us in there that were worked with them, the number nine at the mine, so many of them were identifiable by really sometimes by the clothes they wore, if you could actually see their clothes. Generally, you weren't able to tell because generally they were covered with a mold. And it was uh, an odor you'll never forget also. Of course, we used formaldehyde spray. We'd spray the body, and it was the worst smell, and, and actually the body was, actually handling the bodies. As we proceeded westward, we... Uh, got in a situation where we hadn't encountered too much of a problem with the roof. We would airlock ourselves in and we would proceed a thousand foot, set up a series of checks across the area uh, in an attempt to um, seal the area off and we'd go back and we'd ventilate it. And we're talking an area a thousand feet long, 900 foot across. All that area had to be explored and we explored most of it then with fresh air. And if we encountered any roof falls, it was going to cause a uh, hazard to the workers. All that had to be supported. The track had to be cleaned up. A lot of the track, the track was not rolled over or rolled up or that matter, but the bottom had hooved over a period of time. The track was not level. It had hooved. We uh, spent a lot of time in that area before we got down to the 7 North area, and that was a lot of rock dusting had to go on. All this area had to be rock dusted and rock dusted very thoroughly, very, very heavily. And uh, you're talking maybe four inches of rock dust at least was put on. And once that was done, we would proceed up again with another set of airlocks. We'd open one of the seals up and we'd proceed through the seal and advance another 1,000 feet or whatever we could get. We may, it's a lot of times you didn't get 1,000. You might get 800. Mm -hmm. uh, and you're not necessarily your seals would run direct straight across sometimes due to falls. We were restricted to putting maybe some extra checks in the cross cut, extra seals in to enable us to flush that out with the air. We bring the air up the right side, across the faces or across the seal area and back down the right side and enable us to uh, recover that area and explore that area very thoroughly and then with in fresh air. We uh, spent a lot of time in there and we got down to the mouth of the next section in the 7 North and the mouth of Seven North had, had uh, fallen in. We weren't able to get in. We weren't able to get in through the bleeders in the back end. We tried that also. We were not able to get in due to roof falls. Then again, it was decided to bring the miner out of the Six North area and proceed to split the, the barrier block. Mm -hmm. They brought the equipment down, and and this is takes this takes time to drive four entries or five entries through that solid coal. Got the entries driven through, and we hit fall areas. We were able then to get into the six north or seven north section. Once in on the section, the section was devastated. It was totally wrecked, hmm. and no victims were found. This crew had survived the initial explosion. They had moved. We were restricted to getting out of Seven North to find them due to falls. So we decided then to come back into solid coal. We drive parallel entries along with uh, the three right section of Seven North, drive parallel entries down to near the mouth, and we cut into the Seven North mains. We uh, drove those entries, and it was, again, you're talking four or five months to drive those entries, 2,600 feet, four entries wide. We got down to it and, and it was mined up within three feet of cutting through. The rescue teams then were brought in again and we dug our way through that last three foot of coal with a jackhammer and picks and whatever we could use to get a hole through there. <coughs> Excuse me. We uh, punched the hole through and number nine team was the first team to go through the hole. We put it at airlocks behind us. We went through and we went out to a supply track and a loaded track and we found the crew. Scattered out, but they were we found them 
with the exception of one man. They were down near the mouth. Of they the were section. down near the mouth of the section. They had came off the section. They brought their dinner buckets. They had their coats with them. On the section, they had two gas masks at that time. And they had a self-rescuer. They had a self-rescuer. The foreman had one of the gas masks. The other gas mask or one of the victims we never found. It was believed and thought and myself probably feel that it was uh, with the individual we didn't find. There was a large fall toward the mouth of the section. It's just assumed that he possibly was under that. We did not recover that fall. We did not find him. There was no indication as to him being up or at the fall. There were just no, no signs that he's under it, but we did not find him. That would have put him ahead of the rest of the He crew. was ahead of the, the rest, and uh, at that time the, the procedure was to <clears throat> man with the gas mask in front, man with the gas mask in back. The rest of them had a lifeline. The crew had a lifeline, or there was a lifeline available for them to hold on that lifeline and where, you know, self-rescuer. And it was assumed that he possibly was in that uh, group, but he was a leader, and he may be up around that fall. There was no lifeline found, but they were pretty well strung out in a line, mm -hmm. and they were making an attempt to get out. So we needed to uh, take the mining equipment out of Seven North area and brought it down to the mouth of Seven North. And additional mining had to be done in the barrier block between the track and uh, 8 North Airways mm -hmm. to go down and go down behind the Lou Allen shaft and went to the 8 North area plus in Lou Allen, which we later went into 8 North. We went to Lou Allen uh, Airways. We got in the airways. We After approximately five months of mining, got down to the airways. We cut into the airways, and we ran into Roof Falls again near the Lou Allen shaft. <coughs> it was impossible to get to the shaft due to the roof falls and decided then that we would uh, probably clean them out from the top using a shaft company would clean the shafts out and we would try to bring our equipment in. We'd start working on a roof fall start recovery area around Lou Ellen shaft. They were able to do that and get the shaft open to the point that we had intake air and the shaft being a, initially was a two compartment shaft both intake and return we were using strictly as an intake shaft. We then <clears throat> got back into the cleaning up around the Llewellyn bottom and the roof falls there were more extensive than what we had counted up in the Mods Run area. They were much higher, much more extensive. Uh, you just couldn't see the end of them. And there was probably a six month time period of time there that we spent in that area of roof bolting, loading the falls up and got down actually down to the bottom. There we started to recover some bodies. And the mechanics. What, what year was this? This I would have been that. about 19 and uh, 70, 73, 72, 73 year. And we were able to recover the bodies, uh, mechanics, rock dusters, uh, dispatcher was on the bottom. Dispatcher Shannon at that time. The dispatcher at that time was kept under was underground, hmm. and uh, we recovered the bodies of everyone on the bottom on that particular area and cleaned that all up. And it was decided then that we uh, need to look at eight north section. So we tried to explore from the mouth of from Llewellyn toward the mouth of eight north, which was further to the west. We encountered water <coughs> at, the, at the mouth of 8 North. <coughs> we uh, pumped the water down to the point it was below the mouth of 8 North. We left the water there, using the water as a seal to prevent any methane or anything build up down on the western end. So everything from the 8 North section to the <coughs> face of 10 North was underwater. We made an attempt to go into 8 North section to explore that with the rescue team. And uh, we uh, got to mouth of 8 North and encountered additional roof falls, big roof falls. So we were blocked in our attempt to go in through the mouth. Well, we went back and started mining again. We mined into the sections. The first section we mined into was 
the five right section, which was the pillar line, and this is where a lot of speculation on explosion started here. They'd been a miner covered up there, a continuous miner covered up there on a the shift prior to the explosion. And it was felt that possibly they went up there and they done, which was illegal, was a mud capping, mm -hmm. shooting the rock off top of the miner without drilling it. So it's laid up an explosive charge on the rock. We got into that section, and that was not the case. Uh, the, the miner had been pulled back, and the miner was out front of the fall, and the miner was being worked on. Mechanics were there from the shop, and they were in there working on it. There was one individual at the miner. Mechanics, uh, the dump man, which had been brought up there, and a wireman was up there, and the shift foreman was up there, and this it, people were there to get this section ready to mine coal on the, on the oncoming shift, which had been the day shift. The one individual <clears throat> up at the miner had carried a self rescuer on his belt. He was able to get the self rescuer off. He was to the point of, at that time, the older type, you had to open the lid and then push the plunger. He had gotten that far, but he never got the self rescuer on. The shift foreman, Jeep, had two gas masks on it. And the shift foreman also wore self rescuer. None of these had been touched. He was found down there by the end of the track with the mechanics. They were down there working on a part off the miner on their Jeep, hmm. their uh, equipment vehicle they had down there. They were using a vice and various things. And uh, all of them were found right at the end of the supply track. The second section in there, the four right crew, we mined the coal ends of four right, and the men weren't on the section. The crew had left. We got down, went back, and mined some more coal and cut into the eight north mains area. And we were able to then to explore to the mouth of four right eight north. And at the mouth of four right eight north, we found a crew, with the exception of the foreman. Uh, the crew was pretty much all together there in one cross cut. Had their dinner buckets, uh, coats. And it appears that they come down to that point and the air started to get bad. I mean, this is just an assumption that a lot of people had. The foreman was found, we had to pump some water down in that area. The foreman was found about three blocks away. Uh, thought was, and comments were given that he possibly was trying to, to see if there's any way out. And, uh, was he over in another entry? Or he was over in another entry. Uh, and out by? And out by, apparently trying, everybody had the assumption he was trying to, to find a way out, trying to find some good air, some way to get out. Um, at that time, there were no fresh air escapeways in the mine. We, uh, I was there, when I, when I went there, the first went there, I was always told, go to the return. Get in the return and get out of here, you know. And well, that's the only way you had, because all your belt was on the intake, your track was on the intake. And I thought that's, that was a proper way, but then I gave, gave it some thought. And like I say, there was no fresh air escapeways. <coughs> and a fresh air escapeway is only as good as your uh, stopping line. If you lose something out by, or any part of, the, in, any part of that out by area, that fresh air escapeway, you lose a stopping, lose an overcast, your fresh air escapeway is contaminated. And we, uh, we covered those bodies there. Did they appear to be uh, waiting or, or had they They fallen? appeared to got down to that point and kind of got there together and stopped. And that's why it led to the assumption that that foreman possibly was trying to tell me, you guys stay here, I'm going to go see what I can see or hear, what I can find. Those bodies were recovered and this we're leading up now probably to late 70, middle 74, late 74. 75 era, really, and uh, that left us the main west area, the nine north section, the main west sections, and the seven south area. Well, we decided to go towards seven south. When that area, we had uh, two working sections, plus the top end of seven south was where the crew had got out to Martha's Run Shaft. We had 
two motor crews that we hadn't encountered. We'd found uh, the mainline motor crews. We had uh, motor crews that we, we had actually five, six motor crews, but we hadn't found the motors or the motormen. So the mouth of Seven South was completely closed in with roof falls. There again, we had to come back to mining coal. We mined coal parallel with the old Seven South entries. And this took another three, four, five months to mine this coal until we got up to where we could cut into what was known as the parallel section of three right, seven south. We got up to that point mining, and then we were dug rescue team, dug the hole through. We went through and explored. Nothing was found in the old seven south entries. We crossed the seven south entries. Roof fall here and there, but we was able to work, work our way over to the mouth of Seven South Parallel, those three right Seven South. We uh, went into the section, started into the section, and we encountered this crew, the bodies of the crew, which had also survived the initial explosion and was on their way out. We pretty well felt, one, one indication we felt that indicated to us that the crew was up there. We found one individual's mining hat up at the miner, or near the miner, in the, in the, the breaker post. And the breaker post and everything was still standing. There, there was no roof falls up there. The miner was, you know, looked like he went and started right up. But we found his hat. And that indicated to us and gave a, lot, a strong indication that the crew was on a section when this occurred. And they were, all appearances were they were mining coal. Uh, that crew was recovered as we came out of there. Not much damage on that section. Very little, no damage at all, no noticeable damage. The crew looked like they just shut the machines off and left. Of course, they were, you know, they were dirty. And they must have known that something had happened. Something had happened. They grabbed their stuff and they, they started out. And as we came out of there, we encountered uh, assistant shift foreman on his uh, Jeep or his um, it was a portal bus, and not a portal bus, but it's a vehicle he rode in. It had been derailed, upset, laying on the side, and we found his body there with the, the Jeep. We recovered those bodies, <coughs> and we <coughs> then had another section in the 7th South area, which was the 6th right section. We, mine, again, had to go back to mining coal. The 7th South entries were closed off. We mined coal up till we were parallel with six right. We cut through into six right, proceeded to clean out all those entries all cro up across. Now we're up into 1976, 77. And we encountered roof falls at the mouth of six right. We weren't able to get into six right due to roof fall. We then started mining entries parallel for the six right section in the solid coal. And we're getting up now to late 77. We uh, cut through, or got up there where we could cut through. We cut through and we counted water. We had to pump the, had the water pumped down from a borehole outside. We had a borehole there that was already there for power, so we used that borehole to pump water the water down. Once the water was down, we were proceeded in on the section. The section, what we could find of it, was hit awfully hard. Uh, a fan, uh, auxiliary ventilating fan, roof bolting machine, uh, heavily damaged. Fan blowing down the section, down the heading. Uh, roof bolting machine, the deck lid tore off of it, this type thing. And we weren't able to find any crew at the time. So we proceeded to <coughs> start bolting the top, start cleaning some falls up, <coughs> and finding the power car, finding the way the cables went, give us an indication where the miner and everything was at. It was under a roof fall. The loading machine was under a roof fall. One of the shuttle cars was under a roof fall. We hadn't got to explore down to where the tailpiece was at that time. We bolted that, and we continue to bolt and load, bolt and load, and this this is a exhausting thing. You're doing air doing an air drill, 
and you get two or three air drills up on that fall, and there's, that's not room for a great number of people. Mm -hmm. We uh, bolted that safely, covered it, or whatever we needed to do, cribbed it, and we got down as we continued to load this out, we found a miner, we found a loading machine, and we got down to where possibly the victims are at, but they'll be laying on the bottom, so we had to be real, real careful with it. We sort of backed the loading machine up and we went out with a pick or went out with a shovel and we tried to manipulate this bottom around to find out if there's any victims there. Well, we weren't able to find any. We'd found a section jeep down at the mouth of the section. We knew the crew was in there someplace. And uh, we brought a cutting machine up there to cut a little bit of the corner off and happened to be my father-in-law running the cutting machine. Well, he was on one side, I was on the other. And as he sunk his bar down, it caught the minor hose, water hose, and the minor cable. Flipped his cable. When it flipped the cable, it flipped the body up, right, looking straight at me. And that body sat there erect, did not fall over. I mean, he sat just like he was sitting there looking at me. Chet's cut machine off, and my father-in-law, he, he shook him up also, and we got to get it backed out of there, and then we started calling some people. We needed body bags and this type of thing. So we were able then to go in, we covered that body, and we really put an extensive search on for the rest of them, and we were able to find the two additional men in there. Uh, all appearances was they were moving that cable to possibly open the second buggy road. Because the way the situation was, the way the mining uh, cycle was, the second buggy road could have been open now because we were in there far enough with the miner, they could open the second buggy road. In all appearances, that's probably what was happening because the belt was not running. That was a spare section. Uh, that crew had been sent there when their section went down at the middle of the shift, and they were in their process of getting ready to mine coal. Minor operator safety light, the load machine operator safety light, and everything was still hanging on the load in the miner. Uh, the miner had been backed up probably 18, 20 inches, maybe two feet from the face. But this was the policy at that mine on these bore sections. We'd bring these bore miners back for ventilation purposes. And once you run your canvas up alongside the miner, the bore miner had a huge bores on it, sometimes it was maybe obstructive ventilation. If we backed these up from the face and run a line curtain in, air would then ventilate across the face. <coughs> Excuse me. All appearances was that that miner had never been moved. Uh, power, we could not tell whether power had ever been put on or not. They were a box of bits sitting there beside it, new box of bits. Uh, all this had been underwater also. The new box of bits, uh, safety lights were still hung on the miner on the loader. Uh, the three individuals there had died instantly. They had never went from where they probably were. They probably were handling like cable. This brings us up to about the spring of 78. This was during the winter months. We had to do some more mining to get around to get further down on the section. The roof falls were extensive. We cut into an area where the tailpiece was at, and there was an individual at the tailpiece. No one on the shuttle car operator. He was uh, <laughs> sitting there ironically with a knife in his hand whittling on a wedge. All that was found right there with him. And he had a habit of, he had a knife, and a pen knife, and he was always whittling when he had a chance. He didn't know there was anything wrong anywhere. The remaining crew <clears throat> the remaining members that, that weren't recovered was in the main west area, which we uh, talked about earlier about the water. We left the water in there to serve as a, a seal to prevent any methane buildup. That was all toward the west. There was a main west crew that was down there when the process of breaking 10 north section off. They were two mechanics in the 9 north area, and we had a mainline motor crew that was down there was not found recovered and we also had a motor crew that was in 7 South area between the 6 right and the 7 South area which was never recovered. We found uh, deck lids off of motors 
we found resistance off of a uh, motor, a radio that apparently was on a motor someplace in that area, in the 6 South area. But er everything to the toward that Marthens Run shaft or toward the 7 South section itself was just full of massive roof fall. We tried to start a high pressure fan on the Marthens Run shaft, and that Marthen and it, the water gauge went up astronomical. It just was pulling so hard that it just couldn't pull air through them to any, any great amount. We were able to get some air through them. We ventilated with that for a while. But then it was decided that there was no further exploration. We couldn't do anything more in 7 South. Um, spring of 78, they announced that they were going to close the mine. And there was a lot of people upset over it, the fact that there were 19 bodies remaining that had not been recovered. Um, family members, of course, they got the family, they got the union, and the federal and the state, and the company all have to agree on this. And it was decided that, agreed upon that any further extension or any further exploration in the mine itself would endanger a lot of people's lives. So in August, the preparation was started initially in the spring of 78. Through the summer area, we, here we were uh, recovering what, taking some of the motors, some of the equipment out. A lot of equipment was, we're talking 10 years later now, is obsolete. A lot of equipment was left in there. It wasn't brought out because it was old and obsolete. And August of 78 they was the last of the mine. That's when they started sealing it. There's a miners memorial that was all 78 men names are placed on it. Placed near, it's uh, located near the Llewellyn portal. Uh, the 19 remaining member uh, victims that are in the mine are has a star beside their name. This was erected on an area of the mine that was not mined, and nor will it ever be mined. And to go back to that monument, when you look over the, the names there of all the 78 victims. Uh, Myself, I look up there and see where my name would have been if uh, I'd have been there. <laughs> been right in the middle of it. You know, I, I don't know why I was spared from it. The same things that we have in mining today, we had back in number nine 30 years ago. Don't take shortcuts. Stay on your toes, because it, uh, it can happen anywhere.